in search of soil. It's been a few years since we last chatted, yet I've followed your work from afar. I've always admired it. And one thing I've been thinking about lately, is there anything new that you've came across in the recent past that really changed your view on soil or just blown your mind? Recently, we've been looking into the roles and functions of soil micro and macro arthropods a little bit more deeply. We've always just had the attitude that uh, micro arthropods, macro arthropods were predators, and that's really the only benefit they give to the soil food web. But that's not true. When we started delving a little bit deeper, there are probably more like seven very important functions that micro arthropods do. Just like you know, people used to think that all root feed that all nematodes were bad guys. They were all root feeders. They were just um, if you saw a nematode, it was like, oh no, go and get the toxic chemical because you've got nematodes. Oh my gosh! And right. for fungi, they had the same attitude. The only good fungus is a dead fungus, and that's absolutely not true either. So as we have started looking deeper into the roles and functions of soil microarthropods, they've got protective functions of the roots and the above ground part of the plant. They have uh, their role in nutrient cycling where they are consuming the bacteria and or fungi, more likely the fungi, um, and they're releasing nutrients in the form that the plant needs to take up. Um, they also have a role and a function in forming the aggregates within the soil, those organo mineral coated or um, organic coated mineral particles that are slowly but sur surely chewing away on the mineral particle and releasing nutrients. So, <laughs> microarthropods, we've only begun to stick them into all the different roles and functions that they play in the soil. It's, it's not just that they eat stuff. There's all these other functions. And so give us a year or two to really work on that. And we're going to be publishing a whole nother chapter oh, in the so story cool. about the soil food web. Yeah. For people who aren't familiar, what are microarthropods? So microarthropods are things like springtails or batted mites. Um, the, some of the bad guys like the red spider mites and, um, you know, so there's, there's the good and there's the bad. How do you manage your agricultural ecosystems? So you're selecting for the good guys that will help plants grow versus the bad guys who are messages from mother nature saying to you, bad human being, you haven't been keeping your soil healthy these guys, these bad guys are messengers to say, better pay attention, because if you ignore Mother Nature, what's going to happen? She's just going to send a nastier pest, a nastier disease-causing organism. So, And if you don't pay attention to that, she's going to send something even worse. So you better pay attention at the first message from Mother Nature. This is what that means. What is it I'm doing wrong? And what do I need to put back into my soil to reestablish that condition of health? If you're missing some of those microarthropods in your soil, what's the cause of that? Is that due to some of the same reasons why you might feel heavy weed pressure in a soil, just a bacterial fungal imbalance, or the right materials aren't present in the soil? Why are the microarthropods missing? Yep, same reasons apply, and you've got to now figure out which one. Um, so you've got that whole phalanx of possible uh, problems. What does it mean? And you've got to figure out what's gone wrong because then you know what to fix. So that's why sending a sample or learning to do your own microscope work is so critical because we've got a tool that's going to immediately tell you what's wrong. And that leads right to how do I fix this? So now you've got to find a compost or you've got to find a tea or an extract or something that will um, put those organisms back into the soil. So inoculation. And then you want to promote the habitat that allows them to be the winners. 
and still be there over time. So now we've got to look at, um, is your soil aerobic? Is water in fil in, um, filtering into that soil correctly? Where's that compaction zone? Yep, that's what we've got to do. To, we've got to get rid of that or you know, all the many different things that could be wrong with that soil. We, we want to figure out the cause of the problems. And that's, you know, the chemical world looks at symptoms and tries to kill the symptom. Well, that doesn't solve the problem at all. Uh, we need to figure out what's the cause and fix that problem. If you think about the microscope, I think it's an underutilized tool when it comes to farming and gardening and really soil science for the amateur. I think people can get intimidated by it, and I don't think they realize the value of it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, when when you figure that kids are, who are in kindergarten or first or second grade uh, learn how to use a microscope within an hour or two time period, and you let them go and let them start looking at any any of the choices within the classroom, go outside, grab a bit of soil, grab sand, whatever you want to look at, take a look at it. And they can do a perfectly fine job. It's, you know, we're human beings allow themselves to be intimidated because I think their, their training has always been, don't touch that microscope, you could hurt it. No, you'd have to drop a microscope to hurt it. So as long as you're going through the steps and learning, there shouldn't be any problem. Anyone should be able to use a microscope. Please don't get intimidated by it. Um, come and, ha and work with us. We have people who will help you over their computers. So you'll set up your microscope, you'll get the camera going on your microscope, you hook your camera into your laptop screen, and you share screen with the mentor. And then they can tell you exactly what you're doing. Um, no, that's not the next step. This is the next step. And so just write it down, you know, here's step by step by step. And if you ever have any trouble, we'll come back and we'll repeat this session until it becomes second nature. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, sometimes we're our own worst enemy. And for people that have that intimidation or that fear, you offer courses on learning how to use the microscope when it comes to soil at soilfoodweb.com. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have the microscope course. So that's the foundation class number four. Um, we have uh, the general overall theory of the soil food web approach. So that's foundation class number one. Um, uh, making compost, foundation class number two. Uh, making extracts and teas, um, soil, the foundation class number three. And then we teach people the, to, to start a lab of their own where you advertise and you let your the local community know that you can take their soil samples and you can tell them how to fix their problems. So we're teaching people to run their own laboratories. We've got a consultant training program so you can become a consultant and go out and help people fix their whole ecosystem. Based on all your years of looking through the microscope at soil, what are some of the most common issues you see when you look at soil under the microscope, what's missing? What are the problems? Um, you, you begin to realize that you're missing massive parts of that soil food web. The only thing that most people see when they look at <laughs> soil is a boatload of bacteria. And if that's all you've got in your soil, that's not soil. That's dirt. You're not going to grow plants without using toxic chemicals. Well, and then how much nutrient can that plant actually have in it if it's only getting an excess of nitrogen and phosphorus and maybe if you're lucky, calcium? It's missing all the other nutrients. So how can that be healthy for a human being? So we've got to get this whole nutrient cycling system back into the soil. And that's what we mostly see is that people are trying to grow plants in dirt, not in soil, so they can't possibly have healthy plants for themselves or their animals to eat. Yeah, I think all of us want healthy plants, not just because we only want healthy plants, but because we want to be healthier as people. And I mean, that's been emphasized here with the whole COVID-19 pandemic. When you think about 
bacterial dominated soils in a production setting. Maybe that's a garden, maybe that's on a homestead, maybe that's on a farm. What could people expect if they fixed that bacterial imbalance and they shifted the soil to more of a fungal bacterial balance where it was more even instead of fungally, instead of being bacterially dominated? My expectation would be that weeds would go away. Because as you get the fungi growing, those fungi put out the form of nitrogen for your crop plants, not for the weeds. So that would be my first expectation is what you would notice first before anything else. Maybe secondly, that all of your seeds germinate more rapidly in a healthy environment. And then those plants are getting all the nutrition that they need in the proper balances because it's the plant putting out the exudates, telling the bacteria and fungi what to do. And so the bacteria and fungi go do that because that they're being fed and they're bringing back to that plant the nutrients that that plant requires. So actually, I missed a step. The bacteria and fungi have to be eaten by their predators. And that's what releases the plant's available nutrients because the predators have lower concentration of nutrients in their bodies. So they've got to exit the excess. So Mother Nature very cleverly designed this system to work this way, and it works very well until you start killing stuff. Right. Tillage is a huge problem. Uh, you till, you are asking for weeds. You are asking for a problem with fertility. Your plant's not going to have the nutrition because with tillage, you sliced and diced and crushed all the good guy fungi. You wiped out your uh, predators in the system. So the good guy nematodes are now gone. And the root feeding nematodes are having a heyday out there. It's like, all right, all the competition disappeared. Look at this root. Chow, chow, chow. Right. And you start having problems. So, yeah, it's a, the things we expect to see is a reduction in the weeds. Uh, we expect to see um, seeds germinating faster. We see the plants themselves growing faster, having a more healthy color to them because they're getting that whole group of nutrients that they require in order to be healthy. They start um, flowering earlier. They will um, set seed earlier. Uh, and so that whole cycle goes faster. Your yields are typically higher. Um, it depends on how good a job you've done matching what the requirements of the plant actually are and how much yield increase that you'll get. So people who haven't done a real good job of fixing the problem in the soil, they haven't, they don't have a microscope. They're kind of trying to determine whether their plants are happy or not by the way they look. So they're less likely to get all of the benefits up and going in that first growing season so that they may not see a huge increase in yields if they would get that microscope and they'd be able to monitor what's going on in their soil, then they would be able to get those um, um, balances of the organisms up to the levels that they require and much more likely, therefore, to have better nutrition in the crop material, in the food, as well as higher yields. In thinking about this fungal bacterial balance in soils, one of the things I always hear a lot of times right here on YouTube in the comment section is forests grow in fungally dominated soils and herbaceous plants or grasslands grow in bacterially dominated soils. I think that statement is oversimplified and overgeneralized. When you hear that statement, what are your thoughts on it and what does the science say about that statement? When somebody says that kind of sentence, it is true, but it's minimizing the balancing that has to go on. If you're growing weeds, you know, so if I can use my hands here, uh, if your weeds, if your uh, fungi are down here at the, you know, almost nobody home, and your bacteria are up here at, oh my gosh, you know, 15,000 micrograms per gram of soil for the bacteria, 
this is set to grow weeds. You've got to bring that bacterial population down by increasing the fungi. These two guys compete with each other. The, you know, the normal community is going to, the bacteria are going to come down as your fungi come up. And so now you've got a situation where you might be growing brassica. Um, coal and kale crops require that kind of balance of bacteria and fungi in the soil. Well, if that's not what you want to be growing, you want to get that fungal to bacterial ratio closer together. Now you're growing tomatoes, potatoes, you know, they're all of the solanaceae that we um, like so much. As we want to grow highly productive grasses, you want to get both the bacteria and fungi at the same biomass within the soil. The higher you can get that biomass, and notice my hands are now going up together, if we can get that balance, we'll get higher yields, the higher that fungal to bacterial ratio becomes. So how, what's the maximum yield that we can get in anybody's field? Well, we haven't gotten to that point where we don't get higher yields and higher yields and higher yields. We, we've got more research to do. What is that highest point? There's got to be a limit but we haven't reached it yet, so I can't tell you what that is. But we can double and triple, quadruple, 10 times, 50 times more yield if you can get that biology going up higher and higher in your soil. But what if you wanna grow shrubs? You wanna grow grapevines, you wanna grow blueberries. Well, then your fungi have to keep going up because that's a condition that um, is gonna grow much healthier blueberries, blackberries, wine grapes, whatever kinds of shrubs you, you want to be growing. If you want a deciduous forest, a healthy deciduous forest, that fungal component has to keep going up. Notice that the bacteria are not increasing, but they're not decreasing either. It's just that fungal component is going up. So you got to have the bacteria in there. And what people mostly don't really actually hear is fungal dominated. It's not like fungi are the only thing in that soil. There's just more fungi than there are bacteria. So they got to listen really hard when somebody says that sentence. When If you want old growth cedar, you want you know all those beautiful trees down in California that are huge trunks, you know, all of those um, redwood trees and such, that fungal biomass has, has to be even higher. 75% of the volume or weight of a gram of soil should be fungal biomass in a healthy conifer forest. Certainly during that winter into the growing season, you should see that huge amount of fungal biomass in the soil. Well, but now predators of the fungi are gonna come along and start eating those fungi releasing the nutrients that were being held, that were prevented from leaching out of that soil held in the fungal biomass. The pred predators come along, eat the, the fungi. Now the, um, the trees are getting all the nutrition that they need, but you might go out in the middle of the summertime and see that you don't have 75% of a cup of soil being fungal biomass but they'll regrow. Come the late fall when all of that litter material falling to the surface of the soil um, is decomposed by the fungi, the fungi start growing and completely tie all that soil together so it doesn't leach, it doesn't erode, it doesn't wash down the hill, it stays in place. And so very necessary functions to maintain a healthy conifer forest. In thinking about that, in a farming context, are you trying to be closer to a one-to-one -one fungal to bacterial ratio? You want to pay attention to what the crop it is that you want to grow. What are the balances that it needs? So where is your crop in the successional system? And then you want to mimic, you want to get that food web going. If I take it as a given that those ratios can change given the time of year, is it important to know when you're taking that measurement and that reading 
because you're probably going to get a different reading in summer versus winter. And if you try and balance your soils off just one season, you might get yourself out of whack. Yep. So in um, natural systems, you, you need to pay attention to what time of year it is. In agricultural systems, we're disturbing those systems all the time. And it's almost like we're setting it back to ground zero. Not where we want to be for a lot of our more um, higher level plants to be healthy and happy. So we want to get that fungal to bacterial biomass ratio at the proper level right from the beginning, right when that seed's put into the ground and starts to grow or when that a perennial crop that you might have, you know, shrubs and bushes and things, you want to recognize what time of year it is and realize this is the time of year where we've got to have um, more fungal biomass in their lower bacteria because we want to have beautiful big blueberries that taste really sweet and actually have a blueberry flavor to them. That's one thing I always notice about the blueberries grown with good biology is they actually taste like blueberries as opposed to something that's grown in chemical lands and it's just mush you're eating water yeah and it's like this is not tasty so getting the proper biology really lends so much more flavor to anything that you want to grow if we think about that fungal to bacterial ratio in the soil and how it relates to specific crops, I see how that information could be valuable. Do you have or do you know of a chart that's published that has different crops with the different preferred ratios for those crops? Yeah, so on our website, we have been adding that data. Um, and I think there's a table on the website. Certainly, if you take the foundation classes, we go through that successional system over and over and over again. And anytime somebody who's um, taken the f uh, foundation courses, um, there's a information line that they can call into or they can email us that question. So, you know, uh, if you've taken some of our courses, you should be able to answer those questions yourself. But, you know, if it's like, I never heard of Elaine talking about, you know, these kinds of beans. What is that ratio of fungi to bacteria that these beans require? And so just send us an email and we'll answer that for you. If we think about a lot of agricultural soils being out of balance on the bacterial side for crops like vegetables, could we go the other way and go out of balance on the fungal side when it comes to growing vegetables? Could we create a too much fungus problem? One popular method of gardening now is the wood chip or back to Eden gardening method. A lot of people use it. A lot of people say they get great results. And I think they look at their garden and they think it looks great. It makes them feel great. The results are anecdotal. They're not doing any sort of real analysis there. But by adding all these wood chips on top of the soil, could you be creating a problem by providing too much fungal food and thereby creating a soil that's out of balance towards the fungal side of things? Yeah, and you can do that because... You know, think about what I was just talking about with the successional process. If you want to grow bushes, shrubs, you want to get that fungal, the, that bacterial to fungal ratio, you know, like two times to five times more fungi than bacteria. Okay, that means this is not really good for growing tomatoes. Don't don't try to grow your tomatoes in this because they're they're going to be hurting for certain kinds of nutrients. You really want that. Um, almost equal fungi to bacteria, but slightly on the fungal side to grow tomatoes. So if you're constantly putting um, um, wood chips or other fungal foods into that soil, sooner or later, you're going to go over the edge into something where you've got too much fungi. So you're not seen as good a growth. They're not, your tomatoes aren't as happy. You're uh, corn isn't as happy, your barley, your oats, things like that, are the hay in your pasture are not doing so well. That means you've gone too far. Well, you know, what if it's the other way around? You don't have enough. Yeah, you got to get it into the proper balance for the plant that you're trying to grow. And so how, you know, let's stop putting the wood chips into your garden bed 
right. because you've gone over that edge. Or what if you realize this and it's like, well, but I, I really need to have great tomatoes. And I promised everybody the most delicious tomatoes they've ever had. What do you do to switch this around? Really, the simplest thing to do is to go get some blackstrap, non-sulfured molasses, because that is bacteria food par excellence. You want to get those bacteria revved up and get them going. You just uh, put a very small amount of molasses into the soil, and you'll see your bacteria starting to bounce up. So if you were here you're going to be here pretty rapidly. Don't overdo it. Get too many bacteria. Now you're growing weeds. <laughs> so you've got to be careful as you're doing some of these things. And that's where the microscope becomes so easy to um, give you the answers that you need. You take a sample of that soil, put it on the microscope, and now you look at the balance of the bacterial and the fungal biomass. And you know that you should not be putting on any more molasses right. uh, or you haven't quite put enough. Next year, don't put the wood chips in at the high concentrations that you have been putting the wood chips in. That totally makes a lot of sense. And I think it is a case of too much is not necessarily too much of a good thing. It's maybe this is a guy thing, but it's like when you go to do laundry and you pour the laundry detergent into the little cup and the lines right at the bottom and you kind of look at that and say, that's not enough. And you just pour more in and suddenly you have a Brady Bunch overflowing washing machine moment. And it is important to limit what you're putting in, but it's also on realizing important to know what, what you're putting into the soil, what it's actually doing when it gets to the soil. And you can't see that with your eyes. You can't look at the soil and tell you. You can look at the plants or maybe analyze the plants and have some idea of what's going on in the soil, but you can't see into the soil. And I'm realizing the importance of a microscope here and how that can actually help you see what's happening in the soil so you can get some idea of what you're working with, what you're starting with, so you can adjust from there and you're not just pouring stuff onto the soil or layering stuff onto the soil flying blind, not really knowing if you're adding what you need or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's a really useful tool to help you manage correctly. And, you know, as the, the saying is, goes, you know, if you can't measure, you can't manage. So where's your measurement tool? It's very simple to learn to use that microscope, identify these organisms and know whether you should be putting on more molasses or whether you should be putting on humic acid. And whether you're adding molasses or humic acid or even compost to the soil, those are ways that humans try to build soil. We add stuff to the top or we pour stuff on or we try and turn stuff into the soil. But another way soil can be built is just by nature doing it. Plants. Putting plants in the ground and letting plants help encourage microbial life underneath the soil by getting that carbon pump going, collecting the sun rays, turning it into sugar, and then injecting that sugar into the soil to feed microbial life. When you think about plants building soil, are there fungal favorite plants? Like I'm thinking cover crops that you could plant that would encourage fungi to grow either while the crops are living or that the fungi could feed off when the cover crops are terminated. What are your thoughts on that? Are there crops that are more fungally than bacterially favored? Yeah, if if you want to use, um, and, and see, we always recommend cover plants that are perennial okay. because they're, and you want the really short, low-growing ones. Um, they put their roots down deep into the soil, typically. They're perennial plants. They're going to get those down. They're fairly, they're somewhat woody, typically. Um, and so short, low-going things, so they're not going to interfere with whatever crop you're trying to grow. Um, but you don't have to mow these down. You don't have to crimp them. You don't have to do anything year after year after year for the next 2,000 years. We could have the same cover plants growing and never have to do anything to add more mulch or add more compost or all the other things that are so laborious when we're trying to maintain a garden or um, an acre of your farm or something. So that could be enough. So that's enough because 
they're going to, you know, you harvest the above ground part of your plants, you let the residues fall to the surface of the soil. And because these cover plants are maintaining that biology in the soil, it doesn't matter that it, that your, your crop above ground got um, all dried out, you know, really hot, dry conditions, which is what we want to, you know, before we harvest any seeds. But if your um, soil surface dried and got all hardened out, all of your biology has either gone down into the soil or a lot of that biology has died, which means now you're going to have to do something to bring back that biology that shouldn't have died. It should have been covered by something, but the easy way to do it is to seed in that perennial crop once and then it's there forever. And it's going to protect your soil surface from drying out. It's going to protect your soil surface from one of the most compacting factors ever invented, which is rainfall falling from the sky and smacking on your soil. That's a compacting event. Oftentimes you will see the compaction layer forming at the surface, but if it's not forming here, it's forming down here, usually at about four to six inches. And there's a compaction layer in your soil that won't let your roots grow down as deep into that soil as you want them to grow. And then those cover plants will maintain the biology in your soil after you've harvested your crop plant. Right. So you're still making sure you're keeping the balance where it needs to be for whatever plant you're trying to grow. Make sure you're matching your cover plant to what you want to grow here. It means that you don't rotate your crops you may rotate within the same successional stage, but you wouldn't want to grow brassicas here one year and then corn here the next year. The brassica wipe out all the mycorrhizal fungi that the corn has to have in order to be able to yield well. You, know, you put two, all this uh, mycorrhizal spores back into the soil to, in order to grow your crop this year, and now the next year you put the brassica on there. You are not going to be growing brassica if you've got a massive amount of mycorrhizal colonization in that system. So you stop rotating kind of mindlessly. Right. You rotate and you stay within the same successional stages, not mixing these uh, things that need, need mostly bacteria versus things that need mostly fungi. And so the exudates coming out of the root system of that perennial plant maintain the biology where you want it to be so you could keep growing corn in the same place year after year after year after year after year so um you know here we go with the organic regs organic says the organic management system says you have to rotate crops because they have the mistaken understanding that if you plant the same plant for very long it's somehow going to remove too much of one or two nutrients. That's not how soil works. You keep planting something in the same place, you'll get um, some dominant organisms kind of taken over. But if you have the cover plant in there, now you've got, yep, the main crop, but why not make certain that you've got five or six different species of plants growing as that short, low-growing cover plant or ground cover. It's another term that people use for these kinds of plants. And so now you have a mix. You're going to maintain all the different species of bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes and microarthropods and earthworms and everything else that should be in that soil. So you don't lose diversity. Now, people always say you're going to, if you plant the same thing in the same place year after year, you're going to develop a massive number of disease-causing problems. Uh, you're going to have pests like you wouldn't believe. They just get worse every year. You can't mean, keep growing the same thing in the same place. But you're preventing the diseases and the pest problems from developing by having this diversity. Nutrient cycling is always going to go on. Your plant's always going to have all the nutrients that it needs every second of every day. It will never be stressed. 
and the diseases and pests never come into that part of your garden. So we've got to do a little bit of readjustment of people's thoughts about the, um, having to rotate plants. If you maintain good biology in your soil, you don't ever have to rotate your plants. Keep growing the same thing in the same place for as long as you want to. The whole idea of not rotating crops and growing the same crop year after year in the same location, it's interesting. And it, it parallels, I guess, the natural analogy would be a grassland, one that's not successional, but one that lives for thousands and thousands of years where you more or less have the same species of grass growing in that same space. And you're getting all that nutrient cycling through herbivores and fires and that type of thing that have a robust, diverse microbial community below ground that enable this huge grass biomass to grow above ground that's never really changing. There is no crop rotation in a grassland. It's healthy. And when it isn't, the system fixes itself. So is, is that what we're mimicking here? Yep. I, I like all the, like the blueberry meadows that people have and um, here in Oregon, up in the mountains. As far as we know, and going back into Indian lore, this has been a blueberry patch for the last thousand years. And yet it's some of the best blueberries you'll ever taste in your whole life. And they're not sick. They're not unhealthy. They're not attracting to How can that be? What it means is our understanding of agriculture is flawed as human beings. When we start paying attention to how nature manages things, and we start changing our agriculture to work the way nature works, because nature's only been managing to do this um, process for the last three and a half to four billion years. I think she's had a little bit of time to figure it all out. Why do we human beings have to be so arrogant that we think we know better than nature? So pay attention to what nature does. And probably the, the most important tool that you need is a microscope. So you'll be able to see what nature is actually doing and then mimic her. Thinking about this perennial ground cover in a vegetable type system, what types of plants come to mind? I've thought a lot about this. You need something low lying. You probably want it to provide several functions. Maybe it fixes nitrogen or it's a pollinator or something like that. What are crops that you've heard of or that you can think of that come to mind when you think about a perennial ground cover in a vegetable-based system? Um, we have a whole list of those different plants on the website just because I can't remember them all. Sure. Um, you know, I go out in my backyard and I've got like 10 different kinds of cover plants for where I'm growing tomatoes and potatoes or um celery or lettuce, um, really good match for those kinds of plants. If you really want to grow at, um, the brassica, and most, a lot of people do, brassica, coal, kale crops, um, you want to be pushing actinobacteria in that soil. So in your compost, you want to always develop that actinobacteria community. That's what prevents the mycorrhizal fungi from attacking those root systems of the brassicas. So um, if you want to have perennial understory plants, you want to go towards the creeping thyme, the um, creeping lavender. That's a, there's a whole slew of, of short, low-growing things that have very woody stems, and that's usually a good giveaway. So go to your seed catalogs and start paying attention to how tall do these plants actually grow. And Dutch white clover works really great when we're dealing with the um, tomatoes, potatoes, um, celery, those sorts of things. Um, but the other clovers have driven me crazy. Um, you know, I bought the mini clover that wasn't supposed to grow more than two inches. Well, in my garden, under my conditions, those clovers grow to a foot and a half. <laughs> right. So if you've got a good, healthy soil, look out for the claims about, yes, this is a mini clover. It only grows this tall. Um, we tried micro clover. We've tried all the different kinds of clovers. They're fine under big, tall trees and shrubs. But you grow anything that's going to be shorter, 
no, it's not a good match. I I remember where we grew um, a row of beets and uh, we had, had uh, clover as the understory plant. So we dug out a big space around each one of those beet plants that we put in. So it must have been, you know, eight inches across. And we figured, okay, we've got the clover beet back. It shouldn't, there should be no problem. We'll be back on Monday to see how things are going. So we left and we could see every single clover. We got back on Monday. We couldn't find the beets. They swallowed the up. beet swallowed up, just covered by a layer of clover. And so now you have to dig in there and try not to rip up the beets while you're trying to rip out the clover. And just not worth the time and effort. Um, dichondra is another really good one for most vegetable crops. Uh, dichondra typically doesn't get much taller than a couple of inches, and the root systems go nice and deep down into the soil. Um, pretty aggressive. They don't usually allow anything to grow and take over them. You know, grasses are about the only thing that, yeah, on occasion you have to gonna gonna come in and want to pull out a couple of the grass plants that are starting to grow real tall. But otherwise, dichondra works really well. So this is kind of headline material. I think it's an eye catcher. It's clickbaity, and it's a mind blower for some people. But do you think that if you got your soil in balance, microbially, biologically, that you could dramatically decrease weed pressure and potentially never or rarely see weeds in that soil again unless the soil was damaged? It would be a very rare thing. And then those weeds would be the things that would be sick and unhappy and unhealthy. And they often won't flower. They often aren't going to go through a reproductive stage. If you do see them reproducing, it's certainly easy enough to pull off the flowers. Um, so on rare occasions, we'll, we'll find there was a bear patch or something. A mouse came in and had to dig up something. It buried something. And a squirrel came and right. buried an acorn. Or oh, Okay, so we get the occasional weeds. But... It's certainly not like something that you're going to have to come in and, and deal with or walk down the row with your weed eater and just cut off the tops of the weeds that are growing above your cover crop. I love the idea of the perennial ground cover. And if you had to choose between keeping a perennial ground cover in place and adding compost to supplement the soil from the top, which one would you choose? Obviously, the perennial ground cover has some advantages, like it's less work. You plant it once and it keeps working forever underneath the ground. But there's also some types of plants and commercial crops that a perennial ground cover would be cumbersome with. So could you mimic the perennial ground cover with something like compost teas if you couldn't have a perennial ground cover at the same time as a cash crop just given how these crops grow. Yeah, and, and it's got to be a decision on the part of the person who owns the garden, who owns that soil, that land. Which one do you feel more comfortable doing? And I, of course, being a, a lazy gardener, I want to do as little work as possible. I'd much rather go swimming for the whole entire summer than be you know, pulling weeds out. So I'm always going to pick the permanent cover so that there's not a lot of work there for me to do. But if that's not somebody's choice, that, you know, they, oh, it's too difficult trying to figure out all the combinations. Well, then putting down the compost as a mulch, that's a really good way to suppress all of those weeds. Just make sure it's a thick enough layer. And then you've got to monitor it because a lot of times the weather conditions are such that that thick, nice thick layer of mulch is going to almost disappear within you know two or three weeks, and it's gone, and you've lost your disease suppressive layer. So you know, get back out there and put the mulch on again. Uh, put out the compost teas, the compost extracts. Teas typically go on the foliage, where it, you might certainly, if in the past you've had a problem with a disease or a pest of some kind. Protect the above ground part of your plant um, so that um, there's no surface 
that that disease or pest organism can attack. Um, so they'll go someplace else. They won't even recognize that your um, favorite crop is down there. They're going to go elsewhere because those insects home in on the um, compounds that are released by sick and an unhealthy plant. Uh, insects are looking for something that's not doing well. And so I've always thought of those insects as being, or those disease-causing fungi, as being messages from uh, Mother Nature about there's something wrong with the plant, there's something wrong with the soil, it's not getting the nutrition, it's not getting the protective compounds, so pay attention. And if you don't pay attention, Mother Nature is going to take a bigger amount of your plants next year and the year after, it's going to be the whole acre. And the year after that, well, you can grow something else for the next period of time because you're not paying attention to what nature is trying to tell you. Let's say you are in a crop rotation where you have a bed out of production for some period of time. You grow a cover crop in it, and then you just rotate around between cover crops and cash crops. In the cover crop beds, how would you deal with that cover crop? Do you think there's a preference here between when you go to terminate the cover crop, you could either one, just mow it down or chop and drop it, leave it in place to just decompose on soil surface. Or option two would be when you want to terminate that cover crop, you could just cut it off at ground level, leave the roots in the ground, take the tops, compost them somewhere else, and then reintroduce that compost back onto that plot. Yeah, I'm I'm always going to walk around both of those. <laughs> okay. I'm going to take the third option, which is to not even have that cover crop step in the rotation. There is no need to do that if you're constantly growing this permanent perennial understory set of plants because they're putting back into all the into the soil all of those um the organic matter that your plants are going to need, they're, they're de developing and building structure in that soil. So oxygen moves into the soil and goes as deep as it possibly can. Water infiltrates such that half of all of those pores are filled with water. The other half is filled with air. And you couldn't ask for a better soil if you can get that done. So um, I just don't even want to think about leaving a quarter of my land or half of my land in a non without something growing in it that I can make money from. Right. Okay, as so long as you're maintaining soil, you don't have to do that. Um, you don't have to worry about um, crimping and mowing or um, plant buying the seed every year. Right. You have to go out and buy those annual plants you put them in, you get them to grow, and then you chop them down. Doesn't that just seem kind of nonsensical? I'm with you. It, it's a lot of work, and there's a lot of challenges that go with cover crops. Yet I think people see seeds, and they hear people talk about cover crops, and they think that they have to do them or they should do them without fully thinking through why they're doing what they're doing. When you do have an alternative like a perennial cover crop, and I love the idea of a perennial cover crop or probably better said a perennial ground cover. But I think there's challenges with a perennial ground cover. It's something that's kind of new when it comes to production systems. It can potentially create problems with some crops like low lying crops, lettuces and things like that. You're not going to be able to use a perennial ground cover with those. Do you know of any examples of production farms that have perennial ground covers in place alongside production cash crops like vegetables you know, field. on sm on small scale yeah yep. okay. so quite you know quite a few people in california um up in uh, massachusetts uh iowa yeah various places but it it hasn't really taken off yet because right. i think most people are going i'll switch because it certainly sounds easier but I want somebody else to start to do it first. first right, right. And so we got to get the innovators really clued into all of this. And so like um, we're buying a farm for Soil Food Web School, um, working with other farms in various places around the world um, that we are going to start doing this approach. Okay, cool. So 
come to the demos of um, where we're working. You know, we've got people in Holland and in um, Switzerland and Germany and um, Portugal, uh, Sweden. So well, well represented in Europe. Um, we're working with people in Brazil and Ecuador and uh, Costa Rica, lots of different places. So um, hopefully soon to be doing things in Southeast Asia as well. So it's come to the demo farms. Yeah. Come to the demo farms and, and see what plants work for the different kinds of plants that we're growing, what the crops are that we're growing. You can get a good idea and maybe even the mixture. Um, and that's another business we plan on establishing is we'll get the mixes going in our property. We'll harvest the seeds and then we'll sell pe local people. We'll yeah. sell the seeds to. I really love the idea of these perennial ground covers because it just decreases work. No tilling, less weeding. You're always feeding the soil, less composting. You're really only composting as needed with crop waste, crop residue. But by removing some of this composting from the system and by having perennial ground cover always in the system and by selling a cash crop, how do you deal with nutrient replacement? If you're selling a cash crop, by default, you're exporting nutrients from your property because when the vegetables leave, they take nutrients that came out of the soil with them. How do you get those nutrients back in the soil in a perennial ground cover type situation where you're not adding a lot of compost to the surface? Another way of asking that is, what are your thoughts on soil remineralization? And is it necessary? Because your soil is replenishing itself with all those nutrients by the fact that the bacteria and fungi use their acids, they use their enzymes to break down pebbles and rocks and larger chunks and boulders and the bedrock is all being broken down. And that means more sand silk clay particles are being replenished. So, you know, you might be chewing up some of the sand, silt, and clay and pulling all the nutrients out of them. But down here in the lower part of the soil, you know, whatever, how, whatever depth your soil is, every second of every day, more sand, silt, and clay are being made. And so till the day that you've chewed up all that sand, silt, and clay, all of the organic matter, because remember, the organic matter has all those nutrients in it, too, already in the right balances. So what's wrong with growing plants in pure organic matter? It, it's going to it's got all the nutrients. You just have the biology. You have to have that biology in order to pull those nutrients out of that matrix that they're in pull it inside their bodies, and then they've got to get eaten by the protozoa, the nematodes, the microarthropods, the earthworms, all of those good kids. And that's what releases those nutrients in plant-available forms right next to the root. The root doesn't have to do any work. It just can take up very simple, right from the local surrounding it. It doesn't have to try to transport that nitrogen from two feet away. How long is it going to take that nitrogen to get to the root system if it's two feet away? Well, you've got a dead plant before it ever gets there. So all of those nutrients are in the sand, the silt, the clays, the rocks, the pebbles. And so when you think about that silica bilayer, that all of these mineral components of the soil are built, and in between that silica bilayer are all of the nutrients have already been pulled inside those structures, all you've got to have are the bacteria and fungi with their enzymes come along and pull out the specific nutrients that the plant's asking for. Look, I want boron. I'll give you this food if you go out and bring me back the boron. And then you know, over here it's saying, I need more zinc. I need more iron. The plant is telling that biology exactly what the plant needs and exactly what the bacteria and fungi should be bringing them back for the plant. What about replenishing nitrogen in the system? That's a big nutrient I think a lot of people freak out about. Where's the nitrogen coming from? 
it's especially for nitrogen we have a couple of alternative forms of obtaining nitrogen straight from the atmosphere in terms of nitrogen fixation so if you have any of the legumes if you've got any uh, free living nitrogen fixers um, you those organisms can fix nitrogen and that's one of the things about soil scientists and the way they explain the nitrogen cycle they forget to tell you about any of the biology any of the organisms that have to be there it is the organisms that do all the transformations of the nitrogen from n2 gas into amino acids that's the next step in the nitrogen cycle it it you know you, you always read these papers that say nitrate was uh, produced and released into the soil by these um, nitrogen-fixing uh, microorganisms. No, that is not true. That is not how it works. They forget a whole bunch of the biological steps that have to occur to convert from N2 into NH4 or NO3. So I go through that whole nitrogen cycle and how it actually works and show people Ex what organisms are required for each step along the way. Um, and, you know, <laughs> it is one more form, one more way to get that nitrogen into the soil in the proper form. What's the balance? NH4, NO3. It is the microorganisms that determine what kind of plant you're going to be growing. And uh, so m most of the time, you don't have to have nitrogen-fixing microorganisms to do that job. Um, legumes and free-living nitrogen fixers, you know, the rhizobium and free-living nitrogen fixers, are a small part of that pool. If you've got normal bacteria and fungi doing what the plant tells them, there is a massive amount of nitrogen present in the mineral forms of the soil, in the sand, soil, clay, rocks, and pebbles, etc., your plant can live on that nitrogen. You don't have to add the nitrogen fixation. Well, you know, but why not make one of your understory plants a legume of some kind? Yeah. Grow some, um, oh, well, any one of those nitrogen fixing plants. Grow them in that mix, and you're just adding nitrogen icing on top of the cake. Shifting away from the perennial ground covers, let's touch on compost. One thing I see out there is a lot of compost usage, probably more in the category of overusing compost, applying deep, thick layers, four or six inches at a time, sometimes several times a year. What are your thoughts on using too much compost? Is there a point on the curve where the curve flattens out and you reach the law of diminishing returns where more isn't better and you could get the same results with less and you could actually get worse results by adding more? Mm, so most of the time I get my best production in pure compost. So, you know, if you're adding two or three or five or six or two feet worth of compost into your beds, is it going to be a real problem? Well, the problem comes because they're, um, they don't have the biology in that compost. It is the microorganisms that form the structure, which allow oxygen and water to move into that material mm. and move all the way through. If you have a massive downpour, if you have a really wet springtime and it doesn't stop raining, you, that whole um, pile of organic matter, no matter how little it or big it is, is going to get totally waterlogged. And that's the danger. As soon as you reduce oxygen concentration in that compost or in the soil that's got a decent amount of organic matter in it, those organisms are growing utilizing that organic matter, but oxygen's not able to infiltrate through something that's waterlogged. And so now you go anaerobic. All those beneficial organisms are going to go to sleep. They're going to form dormant stages because they can't tolerate. Their enzymes won't work. 
if there's too little oxygen present. If it's waterlogged, oxygen cannot move through water very rapidly as all, at all, which is why you and I cannot live in the water. Not enough uh, diffusion for us. So these organisms are going to go to sleep. If they catch on that things are going south, that it's getting anaerobic, they're going to produce dormant stages, which means whenever it does get aerobic again, they'll be able to germinate and start to grow. So they're just going to hang out until the conditions get better. But as soon as those anaerobic organisms say, well, ho, oxygen's disappearing, I can germinate, I can grow, and now my enzymes will work because my enzymes are destroyed by oxygen. And so now you start getting your nitrogen converted into ammonia. And of, of course, anybody who knows about ammonia trying to grow a plant, it kills. Ammonia will directly kill your root system. It will kill your above ground part of your plant. So if your soil, if your compost is going anaerobic, you're going to take all that wonderful nitrogen that's present in that compost or in that soil and start converting it to ammonia gas. Well, you can smell that when that's happening. Your soil is going to be left with a really dark black color to it. Under anaerobic conditions, uh, the anaerobic microorganisms are going to use their enzymes to convert the sulfur that's in your soil, the SO4, SO3, S2O3, S2O4, whatever form of sulfur you've got in your soil. And they're going to convert that into hydrogen sulfide, H2S. That will kill your plants. It leaves behind a dark color in your soil. And of course, you can smell that sulfur, sulfur compound as it comes off, off your soil. It's, you know, the smell of... Um, yeah, sulfur smell, wonderful, rotten egg, that's what the word I was trying to think of, rotten egg smell is what's going to be left. Um, so you're going to be losing all your nitrogen, you're going to be losing all your sulfur, and finally, you're going to lose all your phosphorus. Right. PO4 is going to be converted into phosphine gas, and you wave goodbye to all your nutrients, and your plant's going to be killed by the alcohol that's being produced, or by the really low pH organic acids that are being produced. People often say, um, you know, you, you, um, a pH of 4.5 is perfectly okay. You want to grow blueberries in a soil of pH 4.5. No, because the only way to reach a pH of 4.5 in soil is for it to go anaerobic. And that's going to, all of these things contribute to the death of your plant. Exactly what killed your plant? Any one of these things. So as soon as that goes waterlogged, you're in trouble. As soon as oxygen can't move into that soil. So comes in the springtime, that's often a problem that you, you put on a lot of organic matter. The organisms are growing really fast in there. So it goes anaerobic really rapidly, and you're going to lose your starts. You're going to lose the plants that are in that material. So don't make the mistake of blaming the compost for something that water logging was actually the culprit. Right. Could you go the other way and use a lot less compost? And instead of using a lot of compost, you're using less, but you're using really high-quality compost. If the goal of good compost isn't just bulk organic matter, but instead it's to inoculate the soil with good microbes, then is it better to go with less high quality compost than more or a large volume of low quality compost? Yeah, quality is going to give you a lot better result. You want a massive diversity of these microorganisms in, in the compost or in the tea or the extract made from that compost. You want that massive diversity. We don't know all the different conditions that are in your soil. And we know that each species of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, etc., are very tuned to just a very 
limited set of conditions. And they're only going to grow under this limited set of conditions. As soon as the temperature, moisture, nutrient content, whatever changes, a lot of those individual species are going to go to sleep. But then a whole bunch of them that were there waiting for the right conditions, they're going to wake up and they're going to start doing their jobs. So we want to make sure we have this massive diversity. So no matter what these changing conditions are doing, there's always going to be some, you know, a couple thousand species of these organisms always functioning no matter what the conditions are. Conditions change, these guys go to sleep, but these guys wake up. Conditions change, they go to sleep, these guys wake up. So we're maintaining the biomass of these organisms in the soil at consistent levels. We do want to know that we've got massive diversity. And again, how do you know that? Well, it's called your microscope. Take a look at them. You want to be seeing lots of different sizes and shapes of bacteria. Some of them should be modal. Some of them will just be sitting there kind of bobbling in the water. But you see that you've got a massive diversity of different sizes and shapes. Now, some of them like to chain up. Some of them like to make little picket fences. All of that diversity you want to see in your soil. With your fungi, same thing. With the protozoa, same thing. With the nematodes, same thing. You want to see that diversity. And so if we're putting in high-quality compost as an inoculum, we're adding all that massive diversity. How do you know that all this biology is going to be able to take care of all the conditions that will change through the whole entire growing season? We've got to make sure that we've got those organisms in there. If Mother Nature decides to make this a hot, dry summer, we need those organisms that are going to live under those conditions and do their job for your plant. What if it's going to be a cold, wet summer? Well, then you need all those organisms in your compost, too, just to make sure that you've, you're going to have all of the organisms, all of the functions of those organisms are going to occur no matter what the conditions. Well, what if you have, think of all the combinations that you have in your soil. And you want to make certain that all of these organisms are present that can do the work under whatever conditions. We need something around 75,000 species of bacteria. That's not individuals. That's species of bacteria so that you always know that somebody's going to be in there taking care of the job, doing the job for you. You want to have about 25,000 different species of fungi. And all the good guys, not the bad guys, I'm not talking bad guys here, I'm talking good guys. Um, they all have to have aerobic conditions in order to do their jobs. They all have to have food. They all will wake up and go to sleep as required through the course of summer based on the conditions that nature is sending us. That's where you can know that your soil is really going to be healthy. If you don't have that diversity, there could be you know, two to three months where your plant has no support personnel taking care of it. So when I think about high quality compost, I think about it as an inoculant. I think you want a lot of diversity of microorganisms and a lot of those microorganisms. One thing you have me thinking of, though, is seasonality and how seasons change and how microbe populations change throughout the seasons. If you were making compost over a certain period of time, a short period of time during the year, is there a chance that you would only have microbes that are active during that time of the year? So when you add them to your soil, you're missing out on organisms that would otherwise enter a pile if a pile sat there year round. If a soil is going to need organisms in the ground year round, don't you want to be adding organisms in your compost that were there throughout the year? Well, actually, Mother Nature is sneakier than that. Okay. Because where does the original inoculum of organisms that are going to be in your compost pile, where do they come from? They come from the organic matter that you're putting into the pile. Right. Right. And so you don't want to be making a compost pile out of um, you know, 50% straw and 50% manure. And I've gone to composting operations where they say that's the best way to make compost and I just shudder to think about 
the lack of diversity in that straw and manure. How many good guys are in manure? Well, not many. How about on straw? Well, okay, you're going to get some, but nowhere near the diversity that you're going to need. So now how would you improve the diversity instead of uh, you know 50% straw, 50% manure? And I would probably recommend only 20% manure. And I would want to make it a couple of different kinds of manure. Let's not just get stuck with you know, stinky, smelly, sloppy manure. Um, you know, could could we understand that signal when we're dealing with an animal that's got diarrhea? Is that a healthy animal? No, you don't have the good guy organisms in here. You're going to have to do a lot to kill the bad guys that are coming to you in that form. So I want some chicken manure. I want some goat manure. I'd like maybe some llama manure in there as well. And then other um, plant materials. So you don't even have to use manure if you don't want to. But if, if you do, you're adding an, an, an improved diversity. Let's get some alfalfa. Let's get some you know, spent um, grains from brewing beer. Let's uh, a huge diversity. But that's only going to be 10, per, 10 to 20 percent of my pile. Now I'm going to go get some green stuff. So straight out of your garden, all where you've harvested all your peas, take that green plant material. That's going to grow bacteria really well. Well, I, how about cutting some of your grass? Okay, so now I've got lawn clipping, clippings. Well, maybe we really want to go out to that hay field because there's a lot of different kinds of plant materials. There's uh, not just grass, but there's forbs and herbs in there as well. So as much diversity, all, all your kitchen scraps should go into your compost because now there's a huge diversity of other kinds of materials. So kelp and um, lettuces and tomatoes and all that remnant material. Think of all the different diversity of bacteria and fungi that will be on there and protozoa and nematodes. And most people don't like to think of the fact that there ought to be nematodes on the surface of your tomato and you ought to eat that tomato raw because you're re-inoculating your own biome with all these beneficial organisms. So, you know, I often say to people, when you know that it's really com good compost, stick your hands in there, get a feel for it, and then lick them. <laughs> right, right. Because you're putting all that wonderful diversity of microorganisms back into yourself that you require. So, so you need making... Diver diversity to go mm -hmm. in. Yes. But then does time and play a factor, curing time? Um, it, curing time generally starts uh, the fungi um, growing and starting to win a bit more um, early on in that composting process because you're going to turn it so many times. And every time you turn that compost, you're slicing and dicing and crushing your fungi, your protozoa, your nematodes, your microarthropods. Usually the microarthropods, after a turn, they're all going like, no way, we're out of here, we're gone, not coming back. So you got to leave that pile alone. You got to let it mature if you want the microarthropods to come back in. If you want the really good nematodes to come back. You've got to give time for those fungi to grow through your compost again and all those strands start to get, you know, you're going from here's my bacteria, here's my fungi and through that um uh curing system, curing time, those fungi are coming up and up and up. So how much good fungal foods did you have? How many good bacterial foods did you have? You have to go back to your soil and determine what's missing in your soil. How do you know the kind of compost you need to make if you don't know what's missing in your soil? If what you're missing is Fungi, you only have disease causing fungi in your soil. So your fungi are way down here and your bacteria are up this high. You got a lot of work to do. And you better make a compost that's almost strictly fungal. Well, that's hard to do. So you do the best that you can. You get the fungi increased as great as you can. But now in a year or two, do you still want to be making very fungal compost? Look at what's in your soil. And that tells you what you need to be adding. And so now you see that 
I'm trying to grow tomatoes and yet my fungal biomass is here and my bacterial biomass is here. That's not what we want for, for tomatoes. We want this. So now what do I do in my compost pile? I put more green material in because that's bacterial food. And you get that ratio of bacteria and fungi back to what it need, needs to be to grow your really healthy crop. And you've only had to go out there once to fix the problem. So you create the compost that you need, and you see a lot of people trying to speed up compost, compost in 30 days. And that compost could be great compost in theory, if that's what your soil needs. Yep. And if, you know, for the, when you're first making compost and you're kind of in this, I've got to get this compost in before I plant my plants. So I've got to hurry, hurry, hurry. And I forgot to get started. I forgot to, okay. So we want to, hurry along the process of making compost. So it's a 21 day process. If you really push it, it's a 21 day process to bring that temperature right back down to ambient. Do you really have as much diversity as you could have? Well, way better than the diversity that's in your dirt. So get started with the process, but after you've gotten started and things are starting to get balanced and you know, not so much work to do. Now let that pile mature longer. You know, make a compost this spring that you're not actually going to put on until after harvest next fall. You know, if you made a compost last um, November and you're just putting it out now, check it. Make sure that it's got really good fungi in it, that what you want is there. And because you can always alter it by putting in the right kinds of foods. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When we think about adding compost to the soil, we're adding organic matter to the soil. And when you think about organic matter, that's one measure that a lot of people use to judge their soil. They say, I started at 1% organic matter and now I'm at 5% organic matter. What are your thoughts about evaluating soil quality based upon the percent organic matter in that soil? You can get tricked by relying on just that one thing. It's like relying on temperature to tell you whether you're healthy or not. Well, um, your body temperature is not going to be increased when you're dying of cancer. Sorry. Right. It's only good for certain things. Soil organic matter is good for um, certain types of information, but it doesn't tell you what's going to be going on with the biology. We hope that when we put in fungal foods, that it's going to feed a whole bunch of fungi and fungal biomass is going to increase. What if you have no fungal spores? What if there aren't any fungi in the compost or no fungi in your soil? So you put in fungal foods. It's kind of like going out into the middle of the Sahara Desert and putting down the most incredible smorgasbord that anybody's ever seen on this planet. Nobody's there to eat it. So what good did it do? Same thing with our compost. You've got to make certain that we have really good fungi in that pile, especially if we're putting in lots of good fungal foods for those organisms. So be checking your starting materials and making sure you got some good fungi. And when in doubt, go, in, go out, out someplace and take just the smallest, tiniest little hand of something that's got some good fungal strands in it. You don't need much. We do not need to be destroying our ancient forests in order to build you a better compost pile. So only take a very small amount. Put that, spread that through your compost pile at the beginning of the composting process. So that if there were any diseases or pests in that little handful, you're going to deal with them. Um, if you look at your compost at the end of the composting process, and you can see that there's not a lot of really good fungi in there, you'll probably want to go out and buy some inocula. So go out and get some turkey tail. Go out and get some oyster mushroom. Go out and get whatever mushroom you want, or one of the spent blocks from a mushroom farm. Just make sure they don't autoclave it before they send it, sell it to you. 
um, you add that into your compost pile. So you can always go to your grocery store and buy those mushrooms. You can go buy the blocks from someplace that's not going to um, um, autoclave them so that you can be adding inoculum that you know has no disease or pest organisms in it. Mm -hmm. So you're not giving yourself a worse headache than if you hadn't put any of that inoculum in. So always building that material. Focusing on organic matter for a second, what are your thoughts on organic matter and that potentially being too high in the soil? Is there a point at which you would say there's too much organic matter? Here's where I'm going with this line of thinking. If you have too much organic matter, that tells me that the biology in the soil isn't consuming that organic matter. If it's just piling up and up and up, you're adding it, but you're not taking it out of the system by the biology in the soil, which leads me to believe that that soil might not be as healthy as the organic matter percent would lead you to believe. What are your thoughts on organic matter being too high and just having too much organic matter? Yep. And the only way you're going to know whether there's enough biology to be doing the proper decomposition process is to use your microscope. Okay. You know, are the organism numbers dense enough? Um, you know, because you could put on a mile's worth of organic matter, no organisms. It's just next time it rains, it's going to get waterlogged and now it's going to cause you a horrible problem. So you've got to have all components within the system or the system can't work. Um, so, yeah, uh, make certain that you've got the organisms in the compost. I go out to a lot of forests these days and I look at the uh, what's on the surface of the forest floor and I see, you know, two or three inches worth of dead leaf material just sitting on the forest floor. Go back a year from now. It, now all that is is you've got three and a half inches. Next year it's four inches. Next year it's four and a half. And it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. And what that tells me is there are absolutely no fungi in that in this poor forest. This is a dead, dying forest that I'm I'm walking through, and it's a uh, it you know it tears at your heartstrings to realize that you're walking through something that probably human beings destroyed because of drift of toxic chemicals, because somebody came in and said, oh, these poor trees aren't growing very rapidly. Let's put out an inorganic fertilizer. And they absolutely killed all of the biology that makes that old growth forest be an old growth forest. So we have to make certain that the whole system is functioning. Make sure that you've got the microorganisms. Well, if this is an old growth forest, I better be seeing bacteria and fungi in the proper balances. I need to see protozoa, bacterial feeders, strictly bacterial feeders for the most part. I need to see some protozoa, but I don't want to see really high levels because the fungi and the fungal feeders should be the things that are really high in numbers. I want to see my fungi really high when I pick up a handful of that soil and break it open. Lots of good fungal strands in there. But then I also want to be seeing the nematodes um, in there, and I want to be seeing the microarthropods, whose function is to eat that fungi, releasing the nutrients so the plants can grow. I want to see earthworms. I want to see encotreids. I want to see spiders, and I want to everything should be present so this can function properly. So it's not just organic matter. We can't use that as the sole determinant of whether this system is healthy or not. We've got to be looking at the biology as well. Let's say I wanted to add more fungi to the soil. I wanted to increase the fungi relative to the bacteria in the soil. And let's say this is good garden soil. It's not some burned out row crop field. And let's say I'm adding a compost that I think has a high amount of fungi in it. When I introduce that compost to the soil, I'm inoculating that soil with fungi. Can I assume that that soil has enough food for those fungi to survive? Or 
Am I potentially just adding a bunch of fungi that aren't going to have a food supply and they're just either going to die or go dormant because they don't have what they need to thrive and proliferate in the soil? So should I think about adding the inoculant, the compost, along with a fungal food at the same time? Again, as the microscope is the easiest tool to tell you if you're, the fungi that you've added to the system are still growing. You can also be looking at decomposition rate of the fungal foods. They should be disappearing if you've got that adequate fungal biomass functioning in that material. Is the root mass from previous crops a fungal food? Typically, yes. It's more on the fungal side than it is on the bacterial side because the plant is typically going to be storing um, nutrients in that root system that um, are in a form that's long-term storage. So it's protected by being structurally very difficult to break down. Mm. Or the bacteria would break in and wipe out those root systems during the winter time. Um, so roots tend to be more on that fungal side. It depends on exactly which kind of plant you're looking at. You know, you, you, uh, when you look at root systems of the most rapidly growing plants like kudzu on this planet, their root systems grow so rapidly. They're very juicy, very tender, and they tend to be more bacterial food than fungal food. So there, there's some variation there. What's the carbon to nitrogen ratio? Things that have a CDN ratio up around um, 20, 25, there's going to be a goodly amount of bacterial food in there. When we look at perennial plants, their fungal, their carbon nitrogen ratios are typically up more around 100, 150 more fungal food. So probably the easiest way for human beings to look at that is, oh, these are nice white kind of, you know, succulent root systems versus, ooh, these have got just like a bark on them. There's a outside layer that's highly suberized, and that's going to be more fungal food. The fungi take care of that. The bacteria take care of the simple white roots. Probably the short-term, long-term crops correlate. A radish might be in the ground for 30 days. You're going to leave less root versus a tomato, which is in the ground for 150 days. More roots, different type of roots. Yep. Okay. And they have to protect themselves in order to not to be eaten by the bacteria. We've already established that you're a big fan of perennial ground cover that feeds the soil while the plant lives above surface. Let's say I didn't use a perennial ground cover, but I just had crops growing in the soil all the time. So they're putting root exudates into the soil and they're feeding the soil that way. They're my cash crops. Is that enough to feed the soil or would I get additional benefit to the soil by putting something on top of it like a straw mulch? I'm obviously going to do things like save water and maybe cool the soil down by adding the mulch, but am I feeding the soil more and is that really that much better than just keeping a constant crop in the soil where the roots of the crop are feeding the soil? Um, straw is going to be fungal food more than, than it is bacterial food. So if that's what you need to be pushing fungal biomass, the straw might work for that particular process quite well, protecting the soil surface. But once the fungi get going on that straw, the fungi are going to decompose that and now you're left with no protection. If you're growing a, some kind of living surface material, Maybe not perennial. You've chosen something that grows typically in um, a fungal to bacterial biomass ratio close to one to one. So it's, you know, it's got some fungal foods in that material, but um, still a little bit more on the bacterial dominant side. Um, as long as those are the plants that you want to be. You know, you want to put in tomatoes, potatoes, and things like that into those kinds of beds. Um, then that's a, that's a good match for what you do want to be growing there. But if you wanted to grow blueberries in there or you wanted to grow apricots or mango or something like that, um, not going to give you the best response. 
So it's there's no kind of one single answer. People always ask me, what what's the best compost to make? And my response has always got to be, it depends. Yeah. What are you trying to grow? What's missing in your soil? Are these the best plant cover that I could have? What's the best, Elaine? Tell me what to do. And I'm sorry, nature doesn't work that way. Yeah. You're going to have to use your answers. own brain. Yeah. You've got to pay attention. You've, you've got to be talking to Mother Nature. And the way she talks to us is by what's going on in that soil, what's going on with your plants. So we have to learn how to interpret those signals, which means you can't be, really, you can't be a lazy gar farmer. You've got to pay attention to what Mother Nature is telling you. So in terms of quality compost, You've looked at a lot of compost on farms. You've made a lot of compost. You've looked at a lot of composts under the microscope. What are your thoughts on biodynamic compost? It gets a lot of hype. A lot of people believe in it. A lot of people really advocate for it. Is that compost better than their average compost? And is it all that it's cracked up to be? There's, there's nothing that does it all. For all conditions, all places, all crops, etc., um, it's you got to fine tune it more than that. Um, and you know, Robert um, Steiner came up with systems that worked really well for the part of the world that he was working in. He was paying attention to what Mother Nature was telling him. And now, how do you get those concepts across? to the general public. And so we tried very hard to do that. It's his followers that really take what he was talking about and turn it into this um, hardcore, this is the way Steiner said it has to be, do, be done. It's you know, page 25, it says, this is what you have to do. When he was probably, my belief is that he was probably trying to answer somebody's specific question about what was going to work in best in their land under their conditions in their climate yada yada and it just gets too hard line when people do that and it, it scares me a lot when when i think about you know people um being proponents of what i do and they get just a little too rigid Everything's got to have this. Well, no. The, the, the sentence we should always be using is, it depends. Take a look at the system. What's lacking? What are you trying to grow? What are the weather conditions where you are? We're going to do different things in Iceland than we're going to do in Panama. Period, full stop, across the line. Well, it's not the same crops in those two places. It's, um, you know, you've got, got freezing soil most of the year. In Iceland, you never have freezing conditions in Panama. So the overarching principles are the same everywhere on the planet, but they have to be interpreted for the place and time. So at the end of the day, would you pay money, a lot of money, to get like this much inoculant to add to a compost pile? Do you think that you're going to get the results? Would you pay the money? Probably not. I would multiply it. See, what I would do is take that inoculum, put it into um, a compost mix. Find out what's really, what's the inoculum? What's in that inoculum? Is it just bacterial? Does it have the fungi? Does it have the protozoa? Does it have the nematodes? And I would be willing to bet you that you don't find any inoculum that comes in a little kind, tiny container like that that has the whole food web in it. Mm -hmm. Those are probably a couple of species of bacteria in there. If you're lucky, there might be some fungi. But, you know, it's like uh, with Dr. Hika's work in Japan. He isolated a certain set of microorganisms that do very well in preventing club root on cauliflower, coal, and kale crops. But it 
doesn't really work for other kinds of crops with different diseases in different climates. Lactobacillus is mainly what he he um, isolated. I think it was like five or six different species of Lactobacillus, a couple species of Pseudomonas, a couple species of Bacillus, um, a, a couple of um, other species, um, a non-sulfured per, uh, purple photosynthetic bacterium which I love the name of that organism because it's like this long. <laughs> right. uh, and that's what's in his inoculum. Well, it, it does great for brassicas in a soil that's not bacterial enough, that doesn't have enough actinomyces in it, or actinobacteria, sorry. The old-fashioned name, actinomycetes, but they are bacteria, so they're actually actinobacteria. Um, it doesn't do much if you have a tomato that's being attacked by fusarium. Not going to shut that down at all. So uh, you've got to start understanding what is the problem that your plant's got, what's not present in the soil, what's missing, and therefore I know what I need to do. A lot of times we'll use biocontrol agents to start dealing with a problem. So I have an outbreak of verticillium on my potatoes. I'm gonna make up a compost tea where I am going to put a teaspoon of spores of trichoderma into that compost tea. And I know that in the next 24 hours, all of those spores in that compost tea are gonna germinate and they're gonna to start to grow. If you didn't have the rest of the organisms in that water, those trichoderma spores would never germinate. They would never be growing. So you've got to have the biology to get this reaction. All of the uh, trichoderma are now growing. I spray that out. Each one of those spores that comes anywhere near to a verticillium hypha now grows that, the trichoderma hypha grows into the hypha of the verticillium and eats the verticillium out from the inside out. And within a day or two, that whole verticillium plague just psh, disappears. We can do the same thing for fusarium. We can do the same thing for um, any one of the omyces, any one of the disease-causing fungi. So we'll start off perhaps with that step that solves the outbreak problem. But now, because the trichoderma has been in there and it's attacked any fungus, not just verticillium, not just fusarium, not just any one of those other disease-causing fungi, it's wiped them all out, the good guys as well as the bad. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to manage to keep growing the tomatoes or keep growing the cauliflower or keep growing whatever plant it was? We've got to put back an inoculum of those beneficial organisms that were wiped out by the biocontrol agent that we used. So we'll come back in another 24 hours. Well, typically we leave about two weeks for the trichoderma to get over itself. It has, there's no more fungi, no more food. So it goes dormant, produces spores. The spores don't germinate and start to grow unless they're in a compost tea with all those other microorganisms. So all those spores of the trichoderma that are sitting out in that ecosystem, that most of them are not going to germinate. Most of them are going to hang out and wait mm -hmm. until the very specific conditions they need in order to grow are met. So we don't have to worry about them now. Now we go out and we put out an inoculum of really good fungi. We replenish the organisms that got wiped out by the biocontrol agent and your system comes back into a condition of health. So you've got to understand these kinds of, of subtle interactions. And we go through a lot of that in the foundation courses at Soil Food Web School so that people get that experience. We have a section of success stories that um, people can go to and, and look 
what did this person do under these conditions to get this success story? Um, so accumulating more and more of those kinds of stories gives people better and better ideas right. of what they need to do to fix every particular uh, problem that they have. What about mycorrhizal fungi? Would you think about adding those to a system at the very beginning? They can only survive when they're near living roots. So you would have to plant them at the same time you planted a crop. And do you think that they could survive in the soil in between crop rotations or come winter where you wouldn't have to re-inoculate the soil again with them? I would want to use my microscope and make sure that they act, those root systems are actually colonized. And so by um, putting your, washing your roots off, putting them on your microscope and illuminating them, either using an epifluorescent microscope or just taking a handheld UV lamp and illuminating that root system, you should be able to see the fluorescent arbuscules in that root system. And then you know that it's colonized. There's no question. You're not sure. trying to guess. Um, so if you've got dirt, absolutely. Putting in a mycorrhizal inoculum is a very good idea. But you don't want to put it out in, just mix it into the soil because, you know, you've only got a few million um, spores in any packet typically that you're getting. And you've got to make sure that those spores are associated with the root system. And if you just mix the spores into the soil or into the dirt, um, you're probably not going to get any or very few of those spores are actually going to get within 10 uh, micrometers of that root system. That's about the distance that the spore has to be for it to germinate and grow and make it through and colonize that root system before it runs out of the energy that was in that spore. That's all the energy it's gotten. If they're too far away, if they germinate and grow, they'll die before they get there. So they probably will never germinate. So what I like to do instead, if you're going to put um, a plant in that requires mycorrhizal colonization, and not all plants need mycorrhizal fungi, and uh, there are some plants that will be harmed by mycorrhizal colonization. So you, you, know, we, you need to know what kind of plant are you planting. So where we know that we need the mycorrhizal um, fungi and you suspect you don't have any mycorrhizal fungi in your soil, what you want to do is take your seeds, put them into a compost extract, mix in some mycorrhizal spores because the mycorrhizal spores stick to organic matter. They stick, they adhere, they're there, you can't wash them off. So you pull your seeds out of that um, um, seed drench, or maybe other people, what they'd like to do is put the seeds out on a, on a um, moving belt and just spritz those seeds as they go by with that mixture of a compost tea with mycorrhizal spores in it. The, the, micro, the tea organisms will stick to the so seed surface and so will the mycorrhizal spores. You let it dry down a little bit and into your planter box it goes and you go out and plant. And then as soon as that um, seed germinates and that root starts coming out, these mycorrhizal spores are right Johnny on the spot starting to form that connection between the mycorrhizal fungus um, and the root system. So making certain that you have a higher percentage of success is a really important thing to do. Sure. When sure. you deal with good money on it too, right? Right. They, those spores are not cheap, but understandably so it's not easy to um, grow those root systems, get the mycorrhizal fungi to grow on those root systems, get them to make the extra matrical spores and then collect all those extra matrical spores. That's not a cheap job. That's not inexpensive. So um, you want to make certain that when you're growing things like brassica, coal, kale crops, things like that, those are non-mycorrhizal plants. 
So don't be inoculating those root systems or those seeds with the mycorrhizal spores because you're going to make things worse. They're, it's hard for those plants to support their own growth requirements as well as the mycorrhizal spore. It doesn't do that job of bringing nutrients to the um, coal and kale crops. Is this another justification? Is this another reason why somebody might not want to use a crop rotation? You build up a population of mycorrhizal fungi that associate themselves with a certain crop. They're in the soil. You plant them season after season, rotation after rotation, and that population of mycorrhizal fungi stays strong. You rotate in another crop that might not form the same association with those same mycorrhizal fungi. And the ones that you've built up in the soil may go dormant. They may die off. So next time your crop comes back into the rotation, the fungi that used to be there and associate with those roots might not be there or there might be less of them in the soil. So is this a reason to potentially not rotate crops? Yep. Yep. And so why did you do that to yourself? Um, have a section of your garden that is for the brassica, coal and kale crops, the mustards. And that part, yeah, you could rotate within that area if you want to follow organic regs and, and, and not get dinged. And then over here, you would have your needs mycorrhizal colonization so that you're maintaining that soil as close as possible to the perfect condition for those crops. In terms of colonization of the soil, in, in terms of colonization of the soil, what are your thoughts on biochar? One thing biochar has a lot of is surface area, and that provides area for bacteria and other organisms within the soil to colonize it. There's a big push behind biochar. There's a lot of advocates of it. What are your thoughts of it as a soil amendment? Is it worth it? Would you use it? What are your thoughts? I... You know, people will say the same thing about putting clay into compost. Mm -hmm. You need to give the microorganisms more surface area to grow on. And I always like to kind of point out to them that um, there's a lot of organic matter in a compost pile. How much surface area does that organic matter have? More than enough. There is buku surfaces. Adding more surfaces that need to be colonized, is that going to is that going to improve things in that compost pile? Is it going to improve things in your soil? If you've got you know three percent, ten percent, twenty, fifty percent organic matter in your soil, how would adding biochar really make that much of a difference? So I don't buy that one, especially if a biochar doesn't have any bio on the char, I don't think that's particularly very worthwhile. Unless, of course, you've got a problem with a huge compaction. If you've got a lot of compaction problems in your soil, now mixing in biochar, that's going to give you fluff. That's going to force airspace in there. And so you can see a big effect with biochar if you had compaction problems in your soil. But what if you don't have compaction? I, I don't see any benefit mm -hmm. to adding biochar if you've already got good structure in your soil. You don't need to add air spaces to allow oxygen and water and organisms and roots to grow through. Um, what really are the nutrients that are inside biochar? When you start looking at wood chips, it's mostly carbon. It's got a little bit of nitrogen, a little bit of other nutrients, but nowhere near what your plant's really going to need. So uh, I, we've did, we did an experiment when I was at Rodale. Um, um, so we looked at where we added a small amount of biochar. I can't remember exactly how much a little bit higher level of biochar, a lot more biochar, and then where we did nothing. We didn't add any biochar at all to that soil. Otherwise, the practices were exactly the same on everything in that field. And as the crop grew, and I think it was um, soybean, it's probably soybean, 
as the soybean grew, there was absolutely no difference yeah. in anything. They were all the same height. They were all had all had the same nutrient concentration. The biology in the soil was the same pretty much throughout because it was a soil that was already pretty good structure because of all of the organic material in there, all the organisms. I mean, this was Rodale. They're one of the original organic farms on the planet. So it had good structure. Made no difference how much biochar. And boy, the person who bought that biochar for that experiment was not happy with us. Not our fault. We did exactly what the experimental design was. So put in biochar when biochar is going to give you a benefit. But if you can't think how that biochar is going to improve things for the organisms in the soil or for the root system of your plant, then it's probably not going to benefit you at all. And so why spend your money? Do you think the argument for sequestering carbon in the soil is a good enough argument to justify the use of biochar? Let's say you're not even buying it. So you take the money out of the equation and you're making it with scrap material. You can sequester carbon in the soil at no cost. Is that enough of a benefit to justify using it? My, my attitude, of course, is always, uh, why not just take all that really wonderful wood material and make it into compost? Okay. It's going to have a much longer effect um, and it's going to actually provide food. Once you take wood and you turn it into charcoal, um, it's really hard for the microorganisms to use that. It's a long-term stable compound, but um, it's not giving the microorganisms all that much benefit. So uh, if it was the only way we could get enough carbon into the soil would be to bury all that that, um, biochar, okay. But uh, we have other ways to stabilize carbon in the soil. That makes a lot of sense. And I love everything that you've shared in this interview. I want to thank you for taking some time to come on today and talk all things soil on the podcast. So thank you for that. In terms of your courses, people can learn more about that at SoilFoodWeb.com. What do you have in store there? Anything new coming up with the courses or the website? Um, we've started the, um, launch your own lab where we're teaching people to use a microscope, um, and then, um, you know, advertise that they will take other people's, um, samples. So we've got massive numbers of people around the world that are, um, learning how to do this so that if you don't really want to be looking through a microscope, you could have someone fairly local that would be able to do that work for you. They can, you know, bring them their soil, the, bring them your soil and you could even stand there and watch them do your sample and they'll show you exactly what they're seeing on the um, computer screen so that you can go, Oh, well, I just really don't have any nematodes in there. Do I, or fungi or your bacteria are just out of control. So you know exactly what you need to do. That's um, one of the more recent things. We also have a lot of um, consultants that we're training all over the world so that they can take you through the whole process of assessing your soil, what determining what's missing. Now, what's the best way for your soil type, for this climate, for the exact crop you're trying to grow What's the best way to get that biology into the soil so you have the greatest improvement as rapidly as possible? So that's what we're training our consultants to be able to do with people. So keep an eye out for for those folks and uh, you know um, contact us if you want to know who's closest to you or who works on the kind of crop that you are working on and you'd like to have some help. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.